This is The Secret Life of Language, a podcast from the University of Melbourne's School of Languages and Linguistics. A key word is a word or concept of great significance. Our Keywords project follows ever-changing words for an ever-changing world. COVID-19 is the most significant global event in recent history, and it is already affecting how people speak, write, and think. Each episode of Keywords is an expertly curated deep dive into a word that matters in a post-pandemic world. In this podcast, we will examine words that are exciting at the moment, words that shape and inform our everyday life. We would like to acknowledge the owners of the land we are working and living on, the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, who have been its custodians for many thousands of years. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and we extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Keywords podcast. My name is Craig Jeffrey. I'm a professor of geography at the University of Melbourne, and my co-host of this podcast is Professor Véronique Goucher, who is the A.R. Chisholm Professor of French, also at the University of Melbourne. Veronique and I are organizing a series of podcasts on key words for understanding the world in this period emerging out of the COVID-19 pandemic. What we'll do is choose a series of what we regard as important words, which we think we should all be thinking about in the current moment. We believe that words can be a way of developing our thinking in some really interesting ways, drawing especially on Raymond Williams' famous book on keywords published now over 50 years ago. And what we've decided to do for the first series of podcasts is focus on what might seem to many people a rather unusual word to begin with, but we focused on the word nothing. Veronique and I are going to be interviewing a series of University of Melbourne academics to get them to talk about nothing. We'll be asking them what they think nothing means, how nothing is important for their own work, and we'll be asking them whether when you look at nothing, perhaps, uh, well, our hunch is that when you look at nothing, actually you find out that nothing isn't actually nothing, it's actually something. And also that nothing can be very productive of materials, activities, thoughts. In this first episode, we're going to be talking to Adam Hembry, who is a PhD student in the Faculty of Arts at the University of Melbourne, who is an expert on words and etymology, and he's going to be talking about the etymology of the word nothing. And then we'll be talking to Associate Professor David McInnes, who has conducted a great deal of uh, research work on lost plays. These are plays that were written in many, many hundreds of years ago and performed many hundreds of years ago, but of which since been lost. And he's interested in that nothing, in what happens when plays are lost and how even these lost plays may survive in certain forms in the present. So today we are in conversation with Adam Henry. Adam is a PhD candidate in the English and Theatre Studies Department at the University of Melbourne, and he is affiliated to the Centre of Excellence History of Emotions. He is also a performer and a producer, and he is much interested in words. So, Adam, what can you tell us about nothing? Plenty, as it turns out. Uh, it has a, a very interesting etymological history. And it's deceptively simple, I think, to think that it only means no thing or not a thing. I think that is literally quite true. However, it comes from an old English word, nothing, which has its own roots in some older old English words, nay and thing. But the old English roots of thing are not quite as abstract as the word thing is in modern English. I find very interesting that the old English word thing 
doesn't only mean like a, a non-specific referent, but it also meant assembly or a coming together of people or a discussion. And it has its roots in a proto-Germanic term, thinga, which likewise means assembly of people, which means that at one point in the history of the English language, you were able to go to a thing to thingan about things because the word thingan meant to discuss or to negotiate. And we, we keep some of this in our sense of the word thing the same way we do with the word matter. So it's not just physical matter, but it is the matter of discussion. It's similar with the old English word thing. Uh, a thing is the discussion itself, but it's also a thing that you might talk about. And in fact, you might think on or, ne or negotiate or talk about uh, the, the topic. So <laughs> I'm also interested in the sort of further back, even more woolly past of the word thing. You'll hear me talk sometimes about proto languages, uh, which in historical linguistics, they are not languages that have attested vocabularies. They don't have physical evidence in writing or on clay tablets or things like that, but they've been constructed by historical linguists to explain commonalities between languages we do have evidence for. So languages like Proto-Germanic and even further back um, Proto-Indo-European are hypothetical languages that are sort of cobbled together by scholars over decades of research. And when we get far, that far back into the past for the word thing, we find something that's exciting for me in my personal area of research in the history of emotions, which is that the root of the word thing is the same as a Proto-Indo-European word or root for a word that I'm very interested in. So I'll, I'll rewind back a little bit to explain how that connection happens. I've been very preoccupied in my research with the word concept. I'm fascinated by the idea of mental concepts to be meta about it, being our encoded experience of the world, or in fact, our actual experience of the world. Uh, I'm really interested in contemporary neuroscience research on how we form concepts, and especially on how words and emotions are tangled up in that process. And we'll get back to the thing itself <laughs> in, in a second. I'm, I'm almost there. But the word concept follows a pattern that's familiar in language usage, which is that words that have really tangible senses start to accrete new senses that are more abstract over time. So this actually repeats a pattern of cognition that some linguists would refer to as conceptual metaphor, which is to say we have uh, an experience with something tangible, and then we can use that experience to map on to a less familiar experience or a more abstract one. And it's by this process that you can say your love is a rose and your rage is a tiger uh, or a tempest wild. It's because you have those tangible experiences that you can then see the similar structure between them. That is, that is how a kind of basic form of cognition takes place, but it's also true of words and their senses over time. Uh, it's not a rule or a law, but it is a common pattern. So in the course of researching these kinds of patterns, I dug into the history of the word concept, uh, you can learn that its Latin root capere means to grasp or to hold. And that root turns up in a lot of other English words that have to do with thinking and feeling, uh, especially words like conceive and conception, receive, reception, deceive, deception, perceive, perception. All of them, like the word capture in English, are traceable back to this root, which means to hold or to grasp. And this metaphor is a common one. To think is to hold, kind of like what you do with truths that are self-evident you hold them. And the same is true of another Latin word, which means to hold. And that word is tenere uh, or tendere. They both mean to hold or stretch or grasp. And that gives us heaps of words in English that mean thinking. For example, attain, attention, retain, retention, and lots of other words that are interesting in my field of performance history, like entertain. And the Proto-Indo-European root of all of those words, and especially that Latin word tenere, it's 10, which is, of course, in English, still the number of fingers on your grasping hands. And this gets extra interesting for me uh, for today's discussion about nothing, because that same Proto-Indo-European root, that hypothetical root, 10, is linked to another one in Proto-Indo-European, tenk, T-E-N-K. And that is the root of, you may have guessed at this point, thing. So that was a sort of unexpected connection, which is sort of the rule of the day when you look into etymology for long enough. Um, it is sort of this web of evolving senses, and they constrict the further back you go uh, as evidence gets harder to find 
And there's a whole other strand. <laughs> there's a semantic overlap between nothing and zero by way of the English word not from where we get naughty. And uh, I think that's its own very interesting thing in terms of the history of mathematics and arithmetic. Yes, it's not nothing at all, the history of the word nothing. Thank you, Adam, for leading us through the meanders of its history. I just have a question because you came back to the Latin roots. Um, in French, for example, nothing is rien. And rien comes from the Latin res, that means think, a thing. So in French, we have a word meaning nothing, but that means something in, in, in Latin. Do, do you have seen such examples of a word that has taken a meaning radically opposite to the one they had in, in the past? I think that that pattern is, is common. Uh, in the history of language, actually, because sense tends to evolve by association as well as by translation. So in the Old English side of this, so not the Romance language side of this, if we go far enough back, the roots of nothing in Old English are na and thing. But that na, you can go further back. It's not just na, it's actually a combination of ne and an older Old English word, ah, Uh, so it's not just na, it's ne and a. And ne is not, and a is like life force. <laughs> Or uh, actually, it's, it's closer to like ever, the persistence of being, right? And so putting them together, you got not ever or, or not ongoing. And that is what persists in this word, nothing. It's, it's rooted in the word for thing and being, for continuing. It's built on its opposite. That's kind of how that construction works is uh, it's, it's one of negation. And in order to have that negation, you have to assert the thing itself first, right? So it's very similar, I think, to what you just described from the Latin thing being held in some way, even an oppositional sense uh, in the French. And Adam, we would like to know a little bit more about nothing and zero. Okay. So I, I was already interested in the history of zero as someone who studies Shakespeare in the early modern period. Specifically, a lot of my interest involves early modern English glossaries and lexicons and how, how people defined things at that time. It's one of my favorite ways to read play texts and poems from that time is to do a bit of a deep dive on what counted as synonyms for certain words at that time and what, what other senses are attached to words Because I think not only is it a time when English as we know it, as modern English was young, but it was also a time when spelling was irregular and when people really reveled in multiple meanings in metaphor and trying to evade censorship, for example. So I already had some engagement with zero because in, for example, Shakespeare's plays, zero comes up a surprising amount, not the word zero itself, but the concept and specifically through the word cipher. Cipher was a word in the 15 and 1600s, which was used to mean kind of like reckoning or counting to cipher something, much like we would say we would decipher a code today. But it comes from, there is an, a linguistic historical reason for that, which is that cipher in English comes from French and Italian zero, which comes from Latin zephirum, and finally from the Arabic cipher, S-I-F-R would be a way to transliterate it, and safara. And that word, safara, that cipher comes from, means empty, which again is like, it seems abstract, but that's quite a physical concept. An empty room is a physical thing. Uh, it represents a real thing. And it comes uh, from a Sanskrit word, sunya, which, which means kind of the same thing, emptiness or empty. And in that time period, sort of around just before Shakespeare's lifetime, really, the concept of zero really kind of hit Western European mathematics quite forcefully. And it, when combined with the sort of classical number systems, this influence. I remember in fourth grade still, my math teacher, uh, we had to memorize this term. Our number system is called blank Hindu Arabic. Uh, and the reason for that is that it's, it's based on a sequence of numerals from the Indus Valley, from the, the regions that we, we associate with Arabic speaking lands today, but also very specifically because of this concept of zero which was distinguished in Arabic-speaking countries around the 5th or 6th century, I think, AD. And that revolutionized mathematics. It allowed for algebra, more or less. Uh, it, it sort of introduced a concept of nothingness 
that occupied the same kind of place on a number line as any other number, right? So zero, a no quantity is the same qualitatively as quantity. And so this word cipher, in terms of how it's used in art, becomes a really rich metaphor. People are described as ciphers. And, and that is both a compliment and an insult to say that a, a person is mysterious, uh, but also perhaps that they are naughty or <laughs> that there's nothing to them, that what they put forward is a mask and behind that mask is emptiness or nothing. The word not is really the sort of anglicization of this idea. And if you look at those dictionaries, you see the word cipher or zero and the word that's used to define them is usually not or nothingness. And the, the reason that we have the word naughty today is because not by way of metaphor came to have a moral dimension to it. Not only is it not anything, it is not anything good. Um, and and in, in fact, actively a bad thing. So a person who is naughty is up to no good, uh, which are idioms we still have in kind of modern English. And I don't think it's coincidental that the word not has an edamon, the same edamon, the old English na, that nothing does. They share a kind of history that way. I just had a curious question, though, about nothing as a noun and nothing as a verb. And someone told me, and I don't speak German, but that in German there is a word that is sort of to do nothing, but it's just to nothing. Is that common? Has it been used historically? As The reason I ask is because I work with unemployed youth in North India, some of whom sometimes as a way of creating a particular kind of style, talk about themselves as people who are doing nothing. I mean, they also talk about themselves sometimes as people who are nothing and sometimes as zeros uh, counterposed to heroes. But, but I'm interested in that idea of, of nothing as a verb. I nothinged my way around the city. Is, is there a, an example of that in another language or historically? That's a great question. In fact, as I was looking this up, I did notice in etymological dictionaries and in the OED, you will find entries of nothing as a verb. And in my personal experience, I find that that that's usage is often effective for comedy. It's like a, it's a bit of a, a subversion because it's not conventional, which doesn't mean it doesn't happen a lot. It just means that it's, it's nothing is such a common noun or adverb or pronoun that to hear it used a different way has a nice comedic effect. So a personal example, a friend of mine used to always laugh about an encounter she had with an ex-boyfriend and this ex-boyfriend was concerned that her current boyfriend might be jealous that they are still friends and still talking. And my friend was like, oh, this is just him being arrogant. And so the way that she stuck it to him one day is when her then boyfriend was saying, oh, you know, don't you think he's a bit jealous of me? My friend responded, man, he nothings you. Like he doesn't anything you. He does not feel anything towards you at all. There is no you in his mind. Uh, and that's always stuck with me. I love that use of nothing as a verb. Um, I don't think it's common at all, but I think it's wonderful because you immediately know what that means. It transfers to verb territory very uh, intuitively. As for other languages, uh, I'm not sure, but I do know that it's an incredibly common thing to switch a, a word form for emotional impact. And also fascinated by that very direct connection that you made between nothing and sort of notions of a lack of worth of the, in, in Shakespeare, you know, the way in which that word naught, whether it's spelt with an N-O or N-A, U-G-H-T, is associated not just with nothing, but with everything that's bad or useless or evil. I think it's, it's fascinating, although it also note that there are, as you probably know, other points in Shakespeare where he, he talks about the importance of zero as having this kind of performing this magic, like in the prologue to Henry V. And so I think it's, it's interesting, and it's something we're discussing with other people as well, this doubleness of nothing that often it, people feel very uncomfortable about it. It's, it's you know, seen as being problematic or, or without value, but also in other moments has this kind of this value. Yeah, I assume in the Henry V, you mean the, this wooden O being the Globe Theater, uh, but as like, as well as the idea of making something out of nothing that is that is performance in some ways. That's a common conceit in early modern prologues. To oh, is it? No, I wasn't thinking of that. But that's that's fascinating. That I didn't. So there's an, there's another bit in Henry V where they talk about this. The theater is a zero, is the Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, more on the nose. I was thinking more figuratively. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's very interesting. It continues in other, other plays as well. I mean, the end of Othello, you have soldiers surrounding him before he takes his own life and ask them to speak of him as he was, but also 
when someone asks, where is that rash man? He puts up his hand and says, that's he that was Othello. And the whole plot of that play is about a person's identity getting getting emptied, getting eviscerated of meaning because he, he thought he was one person this whole time and has found that he's been made into something else and doesn't recognize himself. He's He's been emptied. I think the the cipher of that play then becomes trying to figure out Iago's motive. Everyone wants to know, why is he doing this? Why is he doing this? And his last laugh at the end is like, demand me nothing. What you know, you know. <laughs> From this forth, I will never speak word, right? Thank you again, Adam, for this um, voyage through the words of nothingness. And I think that if we want to know more about words, we can visit your blog, Into the Words. I like to look at the history of a given word, see what its etymology shows us and what sort of usages today might reflect that history. Thank you, it's my pleasure. I should say it's nothing. So it's great to have with us today, David McInnes. David is Associate Professor of Shakespeare and Early Modern Drama at the University of Melbourne. And David, I have a question for you. I always wanted to know what is nothing in one of the most famous uh, plays by Shakespeare, Much Ado About Nothing. Thanks, Veronique, and thanks, Craig, for having me. Uh, that's a great question. Much Do About Nothing as a title seems to offer us very little. It sounds proverbial, like As You Like It or Twelfth Night or What You Will, and quite different to the earlier comedies like The Taming of the Shrew or Midsummer Night's Dream that give a greater clue to what the play is going to be about. But actually, there's a lot contained in that word nothing. And with an Elizabethan accent, it sounds a bit more like the modern noughting which can be uh, noting, and there's a lot of noting going on in this play, ranging from performance of music and musical notes that are explicitly spoken about as notes to noting and observing what other people are doing. And in the early scenes, you have things like Claudio saying to Benedict early on, he's talking about Claudio, he says, didst thou note the daughter? And Benedict responds, I noted her not, but I looked on her. And that distinction between noting versus looking, it's a bit like the distinction between listening versus hearing. So uh, attention is important here, right? Norting can also be a, a pun on genitals and on sex as well, and it is a play about those things as well. And it can literally just be a play about nothing. There is no dramatic change. There's no cataclysmic events. The war is over before the play starts. That's the backdrop to what we see in this play. So it is an important sense of play about not very much going on. So it's actually a surprisingly complex title. It points us in a number of different directions simultaneously, and they take on an increasing resonance as the play proceeds. Noting becomes really important for Leonardo. If you know this play at all, Leonardo is the father of Hero, who we all think has died. And Leonardo bursts in, in in tears and says, which is the villain? Let me see his eyes that when I note another man like him, I may avoid him. So noting becomes quite important there. It's not a trivial observation. It's burning into my retinas and my eyes here. So when I see another villain, I will know emphatically to avoid a man of his ilk, right? That's basically what he's saying. So noting and noughting becomes really important in that play. It's not quite as trivial and proverbial as it sounds. Okay, so this double entendre on noting, nothing is really at the core of this uh, 1612 play by, by Shakespeare. Uh, well, it's a bit early and that's 1598, but it's performed at court in 1612. And interestingly, at that point, its recorded title is Benedict and Beatrice instead. <laughs> so we have earlier already a tension where early playgoers resist that proverbial title and they want to associate the play with the two famous sparring lovers at the heart of that play instead. It's quite interesting tension, I think, is if people not really coping with the idea of nothing and, and wanting to give a more concrete, precise, descriptive label or something. Whereas I think uh, we all here and hopefully people listening to us can see the potential for nothing to have positive connotations and to be a useful term and concept as well. So David, actually nothing informs your research. Recently, in the previous year, you have been the lead CI on a project called Insights from the Invisible Drama, Shakespeare, Lost Plays and Theatre History. So what did you find in this research project? It's a project about theatre history. It's about the art of performing plays during Shakespeare's lifetime, during which time uh, London has a number of different playing companies operating in a variety of theatres across town. 
and Shakespeare's company is just one of them. And they have to make strategic commercial decisions about what kinds of play to acquire and to use those plays as the basis for repertorial competition to make money. Shakespeare was a shareholder in his company, so he had a vested interest in making money that's tied to that kind of decision-making. And what's fascinating from my point of view is that we, as literary scholars, want to make a great deal out of famous speeches in Hamlet, to be or not to be, do close readings. But of the 3,000 or so plays written during this period, only 543 have survived. So everything we think we know about Shakespeare's day is based on a distinct minority of evidence, on on about one-sixth of the total output. So it could all be a massive distortion. Everything we think we know could be, you know, overrepresented by the surviving drama and be in no way indicative of what Shakespeare's drama was really like during his lifetime. So this project was, and continues to be, because there's a Lost Plays database that I, I edit, it's about struggling with that concept of nothing and gaps in the archive, lacuna in our evidence base. And I've been exploring a number of different ways to work productively with nothing. The one that's my favourite is uh, it's to do with visually experienced forms and the work of Danish psychologist Edgar Rubin, who some people might know about his uh, diagram called Rubin's Vase. It's that image that looks like a cup or or a goblet. It's a black and white image. And then you slowly notice that the contour of that cup on each side actually corresponds to the silhouettes of two faces looking at each other. And it's that interplay between the figure of the cup and the background, which we slowly realise is actually its own image, that's really important to me. It's the idea that nothing can actually have a structural value. It can help guide our perceptions. And unlike other optical illusions like the, the duck rabbit image and things like that, where you can see the same thing two different ways, You see one of these at a time, basically, but they contribute to each other's meanings. So so nothing, in my case, lost plays, two and a half thousand of them, must have an effect on our perception of that 543 surviving plays. So it's that relationship between the lost and and the existing, or what art historians call negative space, uh, the the blank part of the canvas that gives structure to the focal point um, that I found really interesting to think about and, and try to use that to work to guide my work on lost plays. One of your phrases you use really struck me, the idea of working productively with the idea of of nothing. I guess I'm partly interested in whether the lost plays that you've been working on are actually completely lost. Mm. Because one thing that I think is interesting about nothing is that when you look carefully, it's not often actually absolutely nothing. It's often comprised of something of materials of ideas it leaves traces is that the case with these lost plays when you look carefully are there actually elements of them that survive so you're right and lostness isn't an on-off function it's not a binary it's a it's a continuum and you can place plays on that continuum with shades of difference in their ontology some it's about 740 something 43 i think 42 at last count are what we might call the known unknowns, right, (laughs) to appropriate that term from um, Rumsfeld. So something is known about them, a a title, a a snippet of dialogue, a reference in a diary, enough to enable us to reconstruct something meaningful about the play that will give clues as to how it would have been used in repertory, in, in commercial performance. But then there's another huge group about which we know absolutely nothing that has sunk without the trace. These are the ones that we... Uh, conjecture had to have been written to furnish the commercial playing companies with sufficient material as a basis for competition, but about which we know absolutely nothing else. So uh, two kinds of nothing, if you like. And the first category is immensely productive, and you know we've now written four or five books about lost plays with that kind of focus in mind. There's so much information there that we can learn to, to recover those plays and to understand them in context and how it affects others. The other kind, uh, the huge sum, uh, is still frustratingly out of reach. What gives me hope in some ways is, is precisely what we're talking about, how there are traces that remain and, and you can do things with that. And one of the other metaphors I was working with for a long time, trying to think about how to work with nothing, was actually from astrophysics, from astronomy, and the discovery of Neptune in particular, which has a quite unusual story compared to the discovery of other planets, because Neptune was found in half an hour. It was found in half an hour because an astronomer in France realised that 
something weird was happening with the orbit of the neighbouring planet, the now known to be neighbouring planet, Uranus. It had an irregular orbit, and clearly something was exerting an influence on that orbit. We didn't know what that something was, but we posited there had to have been something, not nothing, there. And so by doing mathematical calculations, the French astronomer was able to quickly work out where what we now call Neptune should be. And he called up his friend in the German laboratory who pinpointed it literally within half an hour of searching. So with enough information, we can think about how just as heavenly bodies exert influence on their neighbours, we too can sort of see the effect, the demonstrable effect of nothing, of of lost plays on their surviving neighbours too. And we can start to detect patterns of influence and and the way things operate, not in a vacuum, but actually richly contextually. They interfere with each other. They leave marks on each other. Everything is connected in this meaningful way. I guess maybe an unkind kind of reaction to the idea of lost plays might be, well, maybe they were lost for a reason. Mm -hmm. Maybe they should have become nothing. And maybe you're, you know, working against history by sort of recovering them. How, how do you respond to that? I mean, it goes back to your point about, you know, people being sometimes uncomfortable with nothing, I guess. But, you know, what, what about that idea? That's absolutely true. People being uncomfortable with nothing. And scholars don't like to admit they don't know something. They infinitely prefer to, to posture some sort of a, a thesis, a conjecture that makes sense of the available information and sounds authoritative. It has explanatory value. And so this has been a significant challenge to Shakespeare studies, simply acknowledging the, the extent of loss and the likely impact of, of, of that loss as well. One way that we can deal with this is uh, to, to disregard those prejudices about value and, and point to the fact that at least two plays by Shakespeare were lost. So if you want to cling to value judgments and you want to hold Shakespeare up as being the greatest dramatist of all time in English language, surely it matters that a play called Love's Labour's won and another one authored with John Fletcher called Cardenio, based on Cervantes' uh, Don Quixote, have both been lost. I, I would infinitely love to have those plays over many other hundreds of lost plays, I suppose. There's no question that they would have some intrinsic value. There's also a way to recuperate value in terms of economics. And we have a diary from the theatrical impresario, Philip Henslow, who ran the Rose Playhouse next to the Globe for 10 years in the 1590s. And he records the daily takings from all the plays that were performed. And if you crunch the numbers, as I just had to do for a book I'm working on at the moment, it, it consistently the lost plays are amongst the best performers. And it's highly irregular for the plays that have survived to be the best performing financially. So that idea of uh, artistic value can be negated by thinking about lost Shakespeare plays, of financial value simply by crunching numbers and looking at how business was done. Lost plays weren't simply filler. They were an intrinsic part of any company's repertory and the basis for competition. That's fascinating. Amazing that you know, successful plays were nevertheless lost. I just wondered, David, I mean, obviously you've, you've thought a lot about nothing. I mean, I, I don't know if it's an exaggeration to call you an expert on nothing. <laughs> Where else might this take you, do you think? Do you see other opportunities, not just thinking about astronomy, but other opportunities to think about nothing with other scholars? Yeah, I, I do. And so the most recent book I've worked on is called Loss and the Literary Culture of Shakespeare's Time, and it deliberately tries to extend work on nothing beyond simply lost plays to other lost kinds of texts and documents, to lost persons, to lost people altogether, right, and to other forms of documentary loss in the archive and to textual corruption as a form of loss, and trying to draw a longer bow, I suppose, in thinking about how we're actually confronted with gaps and absences in our daily business all the time. Uh, and, and we need to acknowledge that rather than gloss over it and then think more carefully about how we can work with those gaps in knowledge. So uh, I am very keen to encourage people to, to think about that and to pay attention to that. I don't think doing so makes for weaker analysis, I think acknowledging the limit of what we know and the points at which our arguments are contingent on assumptions is actually a hallmark of responsible scholarship. And I think that kind of transparency in argumentation and dealing with evidence is essential if we're going to make progress in in, in any discipline. We need to know what's unknown and where those gaps in knowledge are so that we can move forward. Otherwise, we're not really being honest with, with the theses that we're advancing. Thank you so much, David. That's been a really fascinating conversation about nothing. And we're really grateful to you for giving up time to come and talk to us about about your work. So thanks so much and, and very best of luck with it all. Thank you both. My absolute pleasure. 
For more info and other episodes, head to the Secret Life of Language website. Licensed under Creative Commons, copyright, University of Melbourne, 2021.